Haytham, Dyer Interview, Take One. It, it seems to me that I have always known this, um, and that I came into this world knowing that, that um, you become what you think about, uh, wh whether you want it or not. Um, I was really very blessed. I, I lived in, a, in an orphanage un, until I was 10, uh, in a series of foster homes um, uh, with my, my older brother, but he was uh, sick uh, quite a bit. He was very anemic, and, and I, uh, I used to have to help him uh, as a young boy. I was, he was 16 months older than I was, and this was when I was four, five, six, and seven, and so on. <clears throat> and I can remember... Um, I can remember I lived out in, in Mount Clemens, Michigan, at, at 231 Town Hall Road with a lady. Her name was Mrs. Scarf. And she, she had uh, a lot of children would come and go from there. Um, and I was in a foster home because um, the circumstances at that time um, were such that my father had walked out on his family. And um, I was born uh, in the Depression. And there was, uh, there was no welfare and things like that in those days. So it was like, People just helped each other out. And my mother was working as a candy girl uh, in Detroit, on the east side of Detroit, earning $17 a week. Uh, and she uh, she just didn't have the money and wasn't able to provide for her children. So we lived out at this one particular place. And um, I can remember um, whenever a new student would, a new child would come to the house, they would always say, go find Wayne. And I would be out in the back. Um, they had orchards there, and uh, this was no hardship. This was no difficult thing for me. This was a great blessing, I think, in my life. Uh, these uh, these those earliest days, and I can remember a girl came, a girl named Martha came, and they were dropping her off for basically the same reasons that we were dropped off there. And they said, "Go find Wayne." And I came and I started talking to uh, to Martha and. Uh, and she was crying and she was all upset and she was sad and I, I was trying to convince her that she didn't have to be sad that this was I remember saying to her this is a great place there's no parents here <laughs> you, can, you can you you can do pretty much uh, anything that you want I mean you've got a lot of freedom and we're going to have a great time and and I and I can remember being in school uh, at, at the public school it was a numbered school they didn't even name them in that day it was PS number 127 and um and I remember the teachers, um, one time uh, we were out in the playground and all the kids were all upset. And, and I said, what's wrong? And they said, well, the teacher said this is the worst class that she ever had. And she was so all, all upset and she was angry and she was hurt. And, and, and I said, well, why would you allow her opinions to have anything? To, if, if, you know, if this is her hardest day, then her life is just easy. You know, and, uh, and I can remember talking to other people about um, all you have to do is change the way you think. And it goes from being a miserable experience or a tough experience or a hard experience to uh, to one that you can do anything that you want with. And and when I my, my mother got our family all back together again when I was nine, nine almost ten years old. Um, and I can remember her telling me what it was like when I was just a baby, when I was just like an infant, that I was I was the one child that uh, could make um, everybody else laugh. At, at times when when everybody else would she said we were waiting for a bus one time when we were just real babies before I went into the orphanage and um, she said a a, a, a a car came by and there was it was in Detroit and there was all this slush and it just and we all went flying down we had everybody had dirt on them and, and dirty snow and we were laying in the in the ground and everybody was crying and she said you were the and upset and mad because our clothes were wet and so on and she said you just uh, stood up and said uh, this is great, isn't this wonderful? Look, you know, we don't have to do this, and we don't. You know, just turning it into something positive. It's like, so the, the ability to be able to do that was something. I can't remember a time in my life when I didn't know that um, if I if I really went to work on on how I thought that things just didn't have to be bad. I was the richest kid in the orphanage. I was. That's I've all, I've talked about that many times in my lectures. That uh, a snowstorm was a time we. We had one. We had two snow shovels at the at the at the at the home, and one of them uh, one of them had the the edges all curled up from hitting the curbs, and you couldn't make any money with that one. So the other one, when it would snow, I would go downstairs and I would take the good snow shovel and I would put it under my bed and I'd sleep with it right right with me in the bed so that nobody else would get it, and I would get up before everybody else got up and I would go out and I would just shovel everybody else's snow, uh, shovel the walk, and then later on and I'd just go knock on the door and just 
tell them that I shoveled their walk. And they'd say, some would say thank you, and some would give me a dime, which doesn't sound like much, but that's about $3,000 in today's money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, and when I found out that soda pop bottles, for example, were, uh, were worth two cents each, that if you took them back, you could get two cents back, I mean, that was just like one of the great awarenesses and awakenings of my life because I would follow people around who were drinking a Coca-Cola and say, uh, you almost done with that? <laughs> they said, well, no, I'm not glass. Well, just whenever you win, I just follow them and said, we'll walk in until, and I had a whole, we had a coal bin where we lived because it was coal furnaces and, and I would, we filled that coal bin with, uh, with soda pop bottles and I would take it back. It was just always, it was just always easy to change and all the other kids would be uh, not having any money and complaining about not being able to have abundance or be able to have some some level of being able to buy themselves like a, just a little donut or a, a, a Pepsi Cola or something they they couldn't figure it out and it always seemed so easy to me that all you had to do is just look around and and see the opportunities in anything and it it had nothing to do with whether there are opportunities there there always are opportunities you know I'm in, I'm 67 years old I have never ever been unemployed or even can even can't even deal with the concept of unemployment I, it isn't that I've had no job I've always had more jobs than I've and it isn't because I've been through all good economic times there've been there've been some pretty sour economic times over the last 50 years or so I just have never known how to think any other way than uh if you change the way you think about things, you, you, you can create whatever it is you want for yourself in your life. It's just a simple knowing. I mean, I've made a living talking about it. I've written lots of books about it and so on. But I have always lived it and practiced it, and I still do today. It was Thomas Troward. I don't know. He did some lectures on mental science way back in the uh, 1907, 1908. He was from Scotland. And one of the things that he said is that the, 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 the law of flotation was not discovered by the contemplation of the sinking of things. Mm. Um, so that, you know, like before the 15th and 16th centuries, um, all of the ships were made out of wood. Uh, not because iron wasn't available and steel wasn't available, but because there was a belief that wood floated. So therefore you had to make ships out of things that floated. That's literally how the... And then someone came along and said that it has absolutely nothing to do with what things are made out of. It has to do with the amount of water that is being dispersed. That's, that's what determines whether something will float or not. And I think about that all the time because it's, it's in the contemplation of what you desire that you create what it is that you want to have for yourself. It's in your willingness to contemplate it. And, and nothing more, according to Troward and, the, and, the, and, and mental science. So that I think about the Wright brothers, you know, a hundred or so years ago, you know, it's like, and I said, the law of flying was not discovered by the contemplation of the staying on the ground of things. So that these were two people, like for me to figure out how to get an airplane to fly and my limited knowledge of all of that, I would probably have contemplated the staying on the ground of things, you know, like <laughs> this is what happened. But there's somebody came along and contemplated the idea that if you get enough speed going and you have the right design and you get pressure underneath something like this and you get that this thing is going to lift off off the earth. Somebody had to contemplate that idea. And everybody who contemplated that it wasn't possible, that it couldn't work, was a part of why flying didn't take place because there was no new law discovered in the, in the early part of the 20th century any more than, the, than electricity was discovered by you know Thomas Edison or anyone like that. I mean, the ability to have electricity has always been there. Somebody has to contemplate so it's like in your own personal life, your willingness to contemplate yourself as a person who is capable of attracting into your life what you want, having the kind of relationships that you want, being able to have abundance where, uh, where you know, scarcity always exists. All you have to do is begin the process by, having, by being willing to contemplate the presence of that in your life. And I've always been a person that I can remember throughout my life as someone who could contemplate myself being able to do things that most people couldn't. I can give you a good example. When I was, when my mother got us all back together and we were living in Detroit on the east side of Detroit and we got a new television set. It was a black and white. It was a screen about this big. It was an admiral. And uh, we had it in our home and it was like, oh my God, black and white television. You know, uh, you remember Uncle Milty and, and all and so on. And, um, the, there was a guy that was on TV, his name was Steve Allen, and he was on The Tonight Show. And um, <clears throat> I was 11, 12, 13 years old. I was born in 1940, so I was 51 or 52. And I used to stay up every night and watch The Tonight Show. 
out, uh, uh, even though I had to go to school the next day, I, it was just something about that show and, you know, all of the characters and smock, smock and all the things that uh, Steve Allen would do on it. And I would come down when I would be talking the next day and I would be telling my mother and my two brothers that um, uh, when I do The Tonight Show, um, this is what I would say. I wouldn't have said the, what, what, what Louis and I say, the way he reacted, how he reacted to that. I would have said this. And I used to do this, and my brothers and my mother would say, that's just Wayne. He's just got, he's just nutty. He, he thinks he's on The Tonight Show. <laughs> he thinks he's going to do The Tonight Show. And I would go up into my room at, uh, you know, on this little tiny house that we lived in, you know, a little two bedroom house that, uh, five of us lived in because my mother remarried. And, uh, um, and I would just, I would see myself doing The Tonight Show. I would just, practice it and Steve Allen became someone that I was really enamored of. Well, you know, fast forward, uh, I don't know, 30 years or whatever so, and it's, uh, and I've written a book, uh, Your Erroneous Zones, and the, the Tonight Show calls, and they ask me if I would like to come on. And so I do my first uh, stint on The Tonight Show. I, I did the show like 37 times over a period of three or four years with all these different hosts, but Johnny Carson was on, and uh, the, the first guest on the very first show when I did the show was, uh, was Steve Allen. And it was like something clicked in me that I had contemplated that as a child. I had always had a knowing. And I can remember sitting there talking to Johnny about this thing that, you know, and Steve Allen was sitting there right next to me and we were talking about that kind of thing. So that by putting my attention on something, it wasn't some deliberate thing that I was doing, you know, when I was 11 or 12 years old that was designating that I was going to be a person who was going to be uh, appearing on talk shows uh, 30 years from now. It was just an awareness to, a, a willingness to contemplate, to contemplate myself in that kind of a place. And I think the power of contemplation is the thing that most people haven't harnessed yet. And when we do, when you harness it in your life, there's absolutely no limit to what you can attract into your life. If you absolutely stay focused on what it is that you know you're going to manifest and attract, you're not going to do it in, in your time. You know, Jackson Brown sings a song that says, and creation reveals its secrets by and by. I mean, you can't push the river. You can't. It's all done in divine time, but it will show. It will show. It, it, it will manifest. It will attract itself. And I'm never surprised any longer about anything that I put my thoughts on that I can attract it into my life. I just absolutely know that law of attraction and that, and that it absolutely works. Uh, and I have no, absolutely no doubt about it. And I feel, I feel as if like, um, before I even came into this world, um, when I was in the world of spirit, that I had a conversation with God. And it was God saying to me, like, uh, what would you like to do in this lifetime? And I said, well, I'd, I'd really like to spend a lifetime teaching self-reliance. Because that's truly all I've ever done since the time I was just a little boy through all my life. I mean, I could just l go through all of the things that I've done. It's all been always about teaching self-reliance. And God said, it's like, you're sure you want to spend a whole lifetime teaching self-reliance? I said, yeah, that's what I wanted. And he said, well, you, we better get your little ass into an orphanage then. <laughs> you know? Rumi said, uh, this ancient Persian poet, brilliant, beautiful poet, he said, uh, sell your cleverness and purchase bewilderment. It feels like bewilderment. It feels like awe. It feels like, uh, even as I think about it now, I can feel myself tearing up behind my eyes because I, you know, only I know what is going on behind my eyeballs. Um, it feels like so, um, so glorious and, and, um, and so, um, so sweet and so, uh, so trusting, so knowing. You know, there's, there's just this powerful knowing that you're not alone. There's this, uh, you know, that it's like there's a safety, there's a sense of that you're not alone. Um, I had this, uh, this great experience years ago. Um, there's a, uh, a friend of mine, he's on, uh, KTAR, a uh, radio station in, uh, Phoenix. His name's Pat McMahon, Irish Catholic guy. And, um, Mother Teresa is to be his guest, right? On the same day that I'm his guest. Uh, so we're in the studio, you know, and, uh, and, um, Mother Teresa comes in. Now well, she's about four foot ten, uh, maybe weighs eighty pounds, and she's there to talk about a homeless shelter that she slept in the night before to tell the people of Phoenix about this homeless shelter. And I'm uh, I'm there to talk about a book that I I don't know which one it was. It was ten fifteen years ago, and um, and um, 
So Pat asks, uh, tells Mother Teresa, is there anything that I can do for you? And he's, you can imagine the bewilderment and the awe that he, this is an Irish Catholic guy from, uh, you know, living in Phoenix. And Mother Teresa, a saint, is coming there. And, you know, he's just bewildered. He's beyond, beyond bewildered. He just doesn't know what to do with himself. He's just so honored. And he says, is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything I can do? And she said, no. She said, uh, I just came here to talk about the homeless shelter. He said, but Mother Teresa, he said, we have a, we have a 50,000 watt, uh, clear channel station that goes in every direction. And it was like he's got his ego involved. Like, I, I can, we can help you to raise a lot of money for your, uh, for your, for your work and your mission in Calcutta. And she said, no. No, I'm not interested in raising money or, or, or your radio station get, getting all. She said, I just want to talk about the homeless shelter. That's all. And he's exasperated. And finally she's, and he's down on his knees. Really? <laughs> and finally she says, stand up. She said, you seem so serious. She said, um, there is one thing that you can do. And he just stood up and he said, what? well, what is it? I'd do anything. He said, she said, well, tomorrow morning, she said, get up at 4 a.m. And she said, and go out onto the streets of Phoenix and find someone who's living there who believes that he's alone and convince him that he's not. That's what you can do. And behind the feeling we're talking about here is this, this feeling of, a, of, a, of aloneness for so many people who are lost in the world, that, they, that I don't have like a connection to something greater than myself. I've come to believe that who I am is, is what I do and what I have and what, what other people think about me and, and who I am is separate from everybody else and, and who I am is, uh, is separate even from what I'd like to attract into my life, that I'm separate from all the things that are missing and I'm separate even from God and that there's, there's a place within me that knows that I'm not separate from any of that, that, that if there's no place that God is not or that source is not or that the energy that provides that is always giving and always creating is not, if there's no place that it is not, then it has to be in me. I know that. And if there's no place that it's not and it has to be in me, it has to be also in everything that is missing in my life or that I think is missing. It's there too. So that in some mysterious, invisible way, I'm already connected to everything that's missing in my life through something called spirit. And when I recognize that, that I'm not here as, as this human being having a spiritual experience, when you recognize that your essence is that you are, you are a spiritual being, having a human experience, not the other way around. When you really get that, I mean, not that you can say it and it's clever, but when you know that who you are is this essence, you don't see there's no other, there's no them. There's no nothing outside of you. You're, you're connected to everyone and everything. As the Native Americans, you'd say that no tree has branches so foolish as to fight among themselves. <laughs> Living the Tao, the Tao Te Ching, this 2,600-year-old, this, uh, uh, some people call it the greatest, uh, the wisest book ever written. Um, it, it speaks so much about, uh, about relationships. Um, uh, Tao, the word Tao, um, means the great way. It's, it's really just, it's just another synonym for God or source or spirit or, you know, that which is the all creating. And one of the things that it says that was really helpful to me, probably the most helpful thing in, in it was that whenever you have a conflict of any kind in any relationship, whenever you have a conflict, that the person who was willing to be of Tao, of God, of source, uh, is the one who will um, practice forgiveness or will go, go to the person that they have a conflict with and, and bring love to it instead of the freeze out, instead of the anger, instead of the hatred, instead of the revenge, instead of so many of the things that we do when we have conflicts in our lives. Uh, we just don't talk to that person. Like, I'm not talking to that. I'm not talking to him. He's, you know, or he, you know, he's going to call me because I called the last time. And that's gonna, uh, but the person who lives the Tao life, the, uh, the, uh, the life of, of, of a higher consciousness, is the person who says, um, I end all conflicts on love, on love, which is what, where we all come from. We come from, we come from a, a source that is love. So for me, that has been just so useful. I have eight children, and, um, and uh, uh, that's been just extraordinarily helpful for me to 
be in a relationship where I can always be uh, of love, where I can just, you know, eat. and so then you don't even, conflicts become something that are, are, are no longer present because conflict requires two-ness. In order to have a conflict, you know, you have to have two, you have to, two different opinions or whatever. But if you live in oneness, if you really see yourself in, in everyone else, see yourself in, uh, in all the things, including the plants, including the animals, and including all beings and so on. If you just, if you just suspend this ego part of you and just see yourself in that other person, then your arguments are really with yourself and your your hatreds are really about yourself and you begin to really see that um i don't have to project anything onto anyone else that isn't what i choose to be and it's again it's the it's having the curiosity it's having the willingness to uh to say this isn't working for me you know it's like you get bit by a snake and you're bit okay so but the bite doesn't kill you you're still there you know, the, you don't buy, die from a snake bite. You don't die from what somebody, you don't get hurt from what somebody else does to you. It's the venom that continues to pour through your system after the bite. That's what causes difficulties in relationships and so on. And when you recognize that, that to be angry, to be full of revenge, I mean, I could bring anybody in this crew in here and do a muscle test with them and ask them a question to hold your arm out, like to, to hold your arm out like this, mm -hmm. and, uh, and think about somebody who has abandoned you, or abused you, who did something that you didn't like, who borrowed money from you and didn't pay it back, who walked out on you, someone that you hate, and just for a moment, just for a moment, hold your arm out as tight as you, as hard as you can, I'm gonna put two fingers right here, and I'm gonna push down, and you think about getting revenge. You just think about, just for, even if you don't want to do that, just think the thought of, I'm gonna get even with that bastard for what he did, or what she did, I'm gonna really get even with him, and you push, and that you find out that they have no strength when you think a thought of revenge. There's no strength in there. Kinesiology, say very simple test. Then if I say, then if I say to yourself, okay, I, I I have somebody that. Okay, um, sit down. All okay. right, here, come over this way. Okay, just uh, yeah, put your arm up. Put your like arm here? Up. No, over here. Over here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now I'd like you to think of uh, first of all. Tell me your name. Michael. Michael what? Gorgian. Is that the truth? Yeah. Tell me you're telling the truth. I'm telling you the truth. My name is? Michael Gorgian. And that is the truth? Okay, that's resist me as hard as you can, okay? And I'm going to just push down, okay? So that's the truth. Now for just one second, just make up a name. But tell me that it's the truth. I want you to lie to me. What is your name? My name is Ron Garcia. My name is Ron Garcia. Is that the truth? Yes, that's the you're truth. You're telling me the truth? That's the truth. Say it again. My name is? My name is Ron Garcia. And that is? The truth. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. You see the shift? Can you see a change in you? Mm -hmm. Can you see mm -hmm. a slight change in you? Yeah, okay, I, you're I strong. That. Okay. Yeah. Now I'd like you, I'm just doing that for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, okay, yeah. Now I'd like you to think about someone. I'd like you to move over this one. There we go. I'd like you to think about someone in your life that abused you, abandoned you, that did something to without any details. I don't want to know any of the details. Yeah. Um, and you are, and you are hurt by it and you are angry about it. And forget about whether you've forgiven them or not. I want you to just think about getting even with them. I want you to think about revenge, okay? I'm going to get even with that person no matter what, okay? And put your arm out and can you hold on to that thought, that thought of revenge, okay? I'm going to get even with that person for what they did. I'm angry at them. And hold on to that thought and just think, resist me as hard as you can. And notice what's happening with your arm. Resist again one more time. Think that thought. I'm really going to get angry. I'm really pissed. I'm really hurt. I'm really, I'm going to get you back for that, okay? And resist me as hard as you can. I notice what's happening here. You have almost no strength. I'm not even pushing down. I mm -hmm. want you to just change the thought. Okay. I want you to change the thought right now. And I want you to change it to one of love and forgiveness. I just want you to surround them with the light of God. I want you to surround them with the most beautiful love that you can think of. And just think of that thought. They did what they knew how to do, given the conditions of their life. I can't ask any more of anybody than that. Put your arm out. Put your arm out. Resist me as hard as you can. And forgive them in your heart. And forgive them in your heart. Now get even, get angry, get really, I'm going to get really even with them and watch what happens. Can you see the change? You see the change? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. That's how it works. Mm. You see? Every thought you have of shame, every thought you have of anger, every thought you have of revenge is a thought that weakens you. Every muscle in your body, it's even in your eyes. Well, I think, yeah, even I, I, like I couldn't look at you when I, yeah. I my you attention see, I, I goes could see the shift somewhere. That every, your heart is a muscle. Isn't it? How many times do we say to our children, you should be ashamed of yourself? Think of, here, watch. Put your arm up. Resist me as hard as you can. Mm -hmm. Think of a moment in your life when you felt great love. 
the greatest love you ever felt in your life. Just think of that moment. And I don't want to know anything about it. Just think about who it was, okay? Can you think of a moment like that? Mm -hmm. Great love. Michael is just loved, okay? And look, look, I can't budge you, right? I'm pushing really hard. Mm -hmm. Now think of a moment when you felt shame. You just did something and you're just ashamed of it, whatever it was, okay? You think of something like that? Okay, resist me as hard as you can. You're thinking shame. And just watch what happens to your arm. Look, no matter how hard you try, you have no strength, do you? You have no strength, okay? Now think love. Think love. Just think of that moment and ship. You see the change? Now mm -hmm. think, think uh, shame. I'm, I'm trying hard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> think shame. Just think of shame. You're ashamed. You're really ashamed. Whatever you did, you're really ashamed. You really screwed up, okay? Resist me, sir. Look, look, you have no strength. Look, you can't think. You know where I learned it? I learned it from my dentist. What? My dentist. I had crowns put into my teeth, uh -huh. and he would get me out of the chair. I said, who's this crazy man? You know, he'd get me out of the chair. He was adjusting the occlusion. He'd say, bite down, bite down. And then he'd go, and if, and if I'd go weak, he'd say, it's not right yet. And he'd put me back in the chair, beep, 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 beep. he'd adjust a little uh -huh. more. And until, once my, he said, now it's perfect. And it always was. It always was. Wow. This, is a, a, this is the power. Who is, who is your dentist? It's like, <laughs> what, what we just demonstrated here is the power of the thoughts that we have. What... A thought of shame, a thought of anger, a thought of revenge. What it does to the muscles of our body. The muscles of our, it's, it's like, the reason I ask you to tell me a lie, you know, yeah, yeah. is because I wanted to test your body. Because your body, your body wasn't made by your parents. You like, we like to think that our bodies were made by our parents. That's because you look a certain way and all of that. But if we take the tiny little drop of protoplasm that uh, created your, created you, and we try to find out its origin, and we take it all the way back to sub, sub, subatomic particles and reduce it, reduce it, reduce it. We find out when we put it in a particle accelerator and, re and re rev it up at 250,000 miles an hour and collide it, and we open it up, there's nothing there. That you came from the invisible. You came from source. It's the spirit that gives life. So that once you understand that this body of yours is a creation not of human beings, but it's a creation of God. It's a creation of source. It's a creation. It came from nowhere and an invisible source and manifested into the world of the physical. And so it can't, it only reacts to, um, it only reacts to truth because it's, it's, it was created by truth. So once you lie, this is an ultimate lie detector test. That's why I said we could have saved $93 million with President Clinton. <laughs> you know, it's like, come on, come on. Did you have sex or didn't you? Let's get over this, you know. Uh, but, 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 but now you're using an instrument of, not of human beings. You, all of our bodies are, are divine creations. And they only, re they only react to truth with strength. The truth that you, the, when you go weak, you're, you're going against your Tao nature. Your true nature is not revenge. Your true nature is not hatred. You came from love. Mm -hmm. And you have to stay in that state. And once you, once you learn that, once you get that, once you, like having that demonstrated could change your life. Just that moment could change forever. People ask me, what is your, your biggest confusion about humanity? It's like man's inhumanity to man. This, this, non, this recognition that we are something beyond ego. You know, and, and we don't, ha you know, we, we have a divided world, a world that believes that, you know, if you're male, you're different than if you're female. If you're Muslim, you're different than if you're Christian. If you're, you know, if you're born on one side of the river, then you're different uh, than the person who wasn't. Uh, and we've, we've taken on all of these ego beliefs. And my, my real strong thing about it is that I think that our, the generation, my generation, when I was in my 20s and so on, we were the generation that, tr that had to end a war. You know, we had to end a war. Um, I took my doctoral orals on the 4th of May, 1970. Um, the announcement came on the radio, on the television, you know, at around four in the afternoon that um, the government had put uh, live bullets into the, uh, into their rifles and they were going, and they fired on students who were protesting the war at Kent State and four of them were killed. You can imagine what I felt because I was really working very hard to try to end that war. Uh, when I had to go in and defend my dissertation, which seemed so trivial, um, when I considered what our government was now doing, we were going to put live, and all these students were doing was protesting a, protesting a horrific war where people were dying in huge, huge, huge numbers. Um, I think the new generation, this generation, it's, um, they have to, they're not going to, their job isn't to end a war. <laughs> it's to end war. It's to end the concept of war. 
And the concept of war comes out of this ego identification of who we are and a belief that I am what I have and I am what I do and I am what others think of me and I am separate from everyone, separate separate from God, separate from what's missing, this idea of separation and so on. And we will inch by inch move towards a place where people will begin to recognize their connection to each other rather than their separation or we'll have to just start all over. We'll have to start it over. As Einstein said, if the, the next war that is fought, he said, the, uh, after the next, after this one, will be fought with, uh, you know, with sticks again. Uh, we'll have to start all over again. We'll have to start all over. And um, it's really about slaying this ego, this, this massive ego thing. It's, you can see it in our foreign policy. You can see it in the way that we treat it. You can see it on television. You can see it in all of the all of the ads that you see for having to take pills for everything. It's, a, and that's what I feel. My my. Uh, my work is is about what my life is about now is is ending the concept of of hatred and separation